Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. In today's video, we are going to do a deal deep delve. If you can't tell, I'm a nerd. This is a D&D map behind me. So we're going to delve deep into one of the deals of a friend of mine, Justin Cambra, who has a pretty large portfolio. Some of his properties are close. He is house hacking, which is one of my favorite strategies. And some of his investments have been at a distance. So what I'd like to do today is maybe talk about two deals, if that's okay. So if you would, Justin, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the current size of your portfolio? Yes. Um, so I just uh, went over the 40 mark. So I'm 41, actually coming up on 42. And uh, I got into real estate investing about five years ago. So August 2020. 16. That's when I bought my first house hack. I was like, how do I get out of the W2 job? And so everyone was doing it with real estate when I found online. So I started. And then over the last couple of years, I've just been aggressively purchasing properties in Washington, Wisconsin, and Detroit. And then the last five years, now I'm up to, uh, let's see, 29 properties and 63 doors. That's impressive. How do you manage at a distance? At a distance, it's actually, it's easier than I thought. Like getting in, like I had to learn and connect with people and adjust uh, different property managers and agents over time. But now that I've got it dialed in, like I've got my same inspector I use for everything, the same agent that I use, the same property manager, and generally speaking, the same lender until recently. Um, so that as I'm finding deals, I just go to the same person, they do their, their task, and we get the property done. Um, and that was really how I was able to scale so quickly. It was use the same people that you like. If I didn't like them, the next property, I found somebody else. If they're good, I kept them. If they didn't, I kept moving on. And literally process elimination, now I've got my, my team of people. That's awesome. I've actually worked with a lot of the same people for a different deals too. And sometimes in the forums, like, you know, Real Estate Rookie or the official Bigger Pockets uh, Facebook group, a lot of people talk about getting an agent to reduce their fee or working with, you know, Redfin or, or Zillow so that they could pay less fees. And my goal is to make sure that my agents make money so that they're motivated to bring me the next deal. Uh, so it's kind of counterintuitive, I think. But let's jump right into the house hack because that's going to be the one I'm probably the most interested in. Tell me about yeah. how that's going. Well, you're, you're looking at it. I'm in, I'm in the house hack still five years later. I bought this property back in 2016. Um, everyone says the market's like super hot right now. It was super hot back in 2016 in Seattle. Uh, so much so that I was getting buyer's fatigue, like putting in offers and working. And they really, everything that was going in in terms of offers had these um, escalator clauses. And so really the only way to get it is like, you had to have an escalator clause. And like, I think my offer was, um, I think it was like 535, 525, and I'd pay $10,000 more up to 600,000. And that was uh, the final one that ended up getting it. But the, I found this property through, through my agent. Um, we were on, you know, had the date, what I call a daily drip. Every day I'd get Zillow and Redfin stuff coming in. Very, there's very few that are actually duplexes that were in my price range. So as soon as this one popped up, I was like, I got to have it. Um, not just because it was a duplex and it was going to be a house hack, but it sits on two thirds of an acre. And I'm like, well, at some point in the future, I can develop uh, that other land. So I was like, this is the property. I got to get it put in that uh, huge, you know, with the escalator. And uh, I ended up getting it, obviously, because you're seeing it. But the issue I ran into the seller ended up coming back saying, hey, we got some other offers on here. Why don't you just write your offer for 590,000 and uh, we'll give you the deal. And I said, that's great. I don't want, I'm canceling my deal because you know the whole escalator is like, you got to show me that you have the actual other offer and then I'll pay 10,000 over that. So then I backed out of the deal and then they came back and they're like, okay, uh, here's the other offer. The other offer ended up being 525. And so I was like, okay, fine. Like I'll go back to the original deal. I want this property. So we ended up locking in at 535. My fear with escalation clauses is always running into an unethical agent that says, we're right up to your max. Magically, somebody offered just below that. Right. Uh, so really good job calling him out and saying, sure, show me, you know? 
Okay, so, and I agree, everybody says this is such a hot market and, and nobody's gonna find any deals and everybody's waiting for the crash or the correction. Um, and they've been doing that since 2013, which means they've been missing out on deals like the one you're in, uh, right. the ones that I got in 2016, 2018, the one I'm under contract for right now. Uh, and so they're missing out on cash flow, um, appreciation, principal pay down. How much were you paying for housing before you moved into this duplex? Uh, let's see. At the time, I think I was paying um, it was close to two thousand um, for just just pure rent, not counting utilities or anything. And now that you're in the duplex, I'm guessing the other side's been rented out pretty much the whole time. Exactly. So it's a it's a top bottom, and uh, I'm in the top, uh, and I I live in a one bedroom one bath, but the bottom is a three bedroom one and a half bath. And, uh, you know, my goal is cash flow. How do I get out of my day job as fast as possible? So I was like, well, if I live in the, in the smaller unit, I'm going to get more rent out of the bigger unit. So I did that. And, uh, you know, uh, come to find, I work at Amazon and I would put it on the interwebs there saying like, Hey, I got this place. You know, if anybody wants to uh, come out, I have an open house. And literally five minutes after I posted it, a guy is like, I'll take it, you know? And so he showed up the next day and he rented it. You know, I, I literally didn't even like do comps or anything. I was just like, well, 2300 seems about right. Cause I was, like I said, I was paying for a two bedroom, 2000. I was like, it's probably right. And it was like a 1980s. It was like the last time it had been upgraded. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll take it. And so uh, I was 2300 of rental income. And then at that time with, you know, my principal interest taxes insurance was roughly 3000. So was it a perfect house act? No. But I was paying two thousand. Now I'm living for net net like seven hundred dollars. So I was able to cut my expenses roughly thirteen hundred bucks. That's huge. Uh, and a lot of times I hear people say I want a house act because then I can live for free. And usually in a duplex you're gonna live for a lot less, but not mm -hmm. quite free. My first house act did the same thing. It basically reduced my housing expenses by about twelve hundred dollars a month, which if you add to the savings rate makes saving for the next down payment a lot easier. So how did you fund the duplex that you're in? So on this one, I, I actually did uh, an FHA loan. So um, since I've, you know, refied multiple times, but um, the original one was uh, FHA. If I remember right, I was in for less than 30,000 on this property um, between down payment and closing and all that. So relatively speaking, pretty inexpensive to buy a property here in Seattle, a duplex with uh, two thirds of an acre. 30,000 in to reduce your housing expenses by $1,300 a month. Right. Uh, sounds like a pretty good deal. And then you refinanced later and I'm guessing took, did you take money out or did you reduce, get rid of the PMI? The latter. So um, my first refi I got, got out of the PI, uh, PMI with that, plus the lower interest, my payment actually went down quite a bit um, to where I, right now I'm sitting at 2,800 is my principal interest taxes and insurance. And so, but my, my rents have gone up. So now I basically am living for free today. Awesome. Unrelated question, kind of related. Do you know what you're paying annually for homeowners insurance? Uh, yeah, for this property, it is, um, it's between, it's, I'll call it 1100. It's between a thousand and 1200. I can't remember the number. Okay, oh, good. I've, so I was talking to somebody the other day and they were paying something like 3,800 for a duplex. And I thought, I had quotes around there too when I was looking for my duplex, but it, down here in Pierce County and Thurston County, most of my duplexes cost me four hundred dollars a year. So right. shopping around for homeowners insurance is is a can have a big impact too. But if you're in that range and you're in Seattle, you're probably at a, at a good rate. And so you've been living in there for five years. You've raised the rents. What is the long term goal with this current house hack? These house hacks um, they sound great, but there's some work that goes into them. I mentioned before I had a long-term renter in there. I was getting 2,300. That person got a job out of state. So then they left. And so instead of uh, putting a new tenant in there, I was like, well, why don't I upgrade it and then try Airbnb? Cause like, you know, Airbnb, that was like 2018, I think 2019. And Airbnb like, you know, is becoming more and more popular. I was like, this is the time to try it out. I did it and I hired a third party company. They took a pretty good chunk out of it, but I probably averaged about 2,500, but there was a lot of uh, in, people in and out, obviously, because of an Airbnb. And I had to put, uh, I think I put about 15 or 20,000 in to 
basically you do a cosmetic rehab and then furnish it. Um, so that was going great. And then we obviously we got into the uh, pandemic world and literally overnight I had all my bookings for three months, just poof gone. So then I had to pivot and I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And I'm like, I heard about this traveling nurses. I advertised um, on traveling nurses, super cheap, only like a hundred bucks for the year. I'm doing traveling nurses. Now I have my fourth set of traveling nurses showed up yesterday. Uh, but now my income is 2750. So I went from 2300 to 2500. Now I'm at 2750. And these are intermediate. They usually stay about 90 to 120 days. Basically, I live for free. It's zoned R6, which means I can put six units per acre. So if I have two thirds of an acre, I can put four units. I have a duplex there, I could put another duplex. But really the, the end game is that my neighbor, um, he's at R18. So if I go R18, two thirds of 18, I can put 12 units on here. So that's probably my game plan is tear this building down, redevelop, put 12 units on. Um, where we're at in the uh, real estate cycle, I'm just gonna hold off. Um, in terms of doing that development on the next kind of upswing, go through the entitlements and uh, then do the build out at that point in time. So that's pretty cool that you have a, a long-term goal that could be as creative as you want it to be just about. Thanks for breaking down Airbnb versus traveling nurses. I have some friends that do Airbnb and they make at least twice what I would expect to get from regular rents. Someday I'm going to turn one of my units into an Airbnb, but not today. And so I might call you and ask you a bunch of questions when it comes up. Awesome. Cool. So now let's shift. And I want to say shift gears because I run a truck driving school and there's my pun for the day. But your property that you would like to talk about that's at a distance. Mm -hmm. How did you pick the markets that you look at? My main market is Milwaukee. Uh, most of my properties are 20 of the 29 are there. It was a young guy out of Southern California. who was talking about buying duplexes in Milwaukee. And he was saying the pricing and I'm like, that's crazy. You can't even build it for that price. It just so happened that I have my annual golf trip with uh, my buddies from my prior, prior job in Madison. And so instead of flying into Chicago, which I normally do, I flew into Milwaukee, met with an agent and I was just like, oh my God, this is Seattle with one less zero at the end. Uh, that I flew out there, I think it was August. And then I bought my first one in October of 2017 second one in december and then you know i bought 18 more and then in the next what three four years from there so the first 10 were they in your name or did you start using llc's and go with commercial loans some people are very uh programmatic and they plan it all out i'm the other way around i'm like let me just go get a deal and then like figure it out as i go for example like when i bought that 11 unit i went to my mortgage broker guy he's like I don't do commercial loans. And I'm like, well, what's a commercial loan? And he's like, well, that's, you know, that's 11 units. So anything of five or above is commercial. Let me connect you with a commercial guy. So like, that's kind of like, I just get in and, and learn it. Um, when I got into Milwaukee, I was like, okay, well, how am I going to do this? So then I just asked my agent in Milwaukee. He gave me a contact and ended up doing the first one uh, was a personal loan. Then I was like, okay, now I want to buy the next one. Um, and I had, started getting, you know, working more and more with US Bank. And they're like, Oh, yeah, we can do commercial loans. I'm like, tell me more about this commercial loan. And so the second one, uh, actually, I take that back. The second one I bought in Milwaukee was US Bank, personally. And then I after beginning to know um, when I set up my LLC, and I set up a business account, they're like, well, you should probably look at doing these commercial loans. So they educated me on that. And then pretty much 2018 to today, except for this house, is all LLC. So when you do a commercial loan, this has kind of always been the barrier for me as to going with personal loans versus commercial is the loan structure. So I understand that fees are a little bit or a little bit worse, the interest rates a little bit worse usually, so not every time but usually. But the loan reevaluation period is the thing that scares me away. So do your loans have those at the 5, 7 or 10 year mark where they're going to reevaluate? Yep, they're the typical commercial loan, depending on what bank you go to, is generally a five-year fixed period, amortized over, depends on the bank, 20 years, 25, 30. My, most of mine are all 25-year amortization. And so what that means is that at the end of five years, if I haven't already refinanced, I need to um, refinance with them 
or go go to somebody else. Otherwise, I need to bring all the money, like i.e., a balloon payment. The there's one thing that you have to be concerned about is that um, there is that five year window. We've been or I've been very lucky. Like you know, interest rates have gone down for five years, right? So like I've been refinancing, actually pulling money out, and my payment goes lower, which is mind blowing. With that said, we're probably going the other direction for the next five years. So I've been looking at like doing some of these um, asset backed uh, type loans that are like more focused on the property. Uh, I think they call them non-qualifying mortgages where it's higher interest, but I can lock it in for 30 years. I, it just gets me more comfortable, especially if I were to leave my W-2 job. If, if I do that at the same time, all these loans reset at a higher price, you know, that would be you know, detrimental to cash flow. Okay. So you look in Milwaukee, how did you find the agents and property manager that you use there? So for the agent, um, you know, this is kind of an Amazon guiding principle that we use where you kind of just work backwards from the customer. And so like, I'm always looking on online. I'm like, you know, if I'm a, if I was a local person trying to find an agent, what would I do? I'd go to Google and I'd type in, you know, real estate agent, investor agent. Um, I'm also looking at like, cause I was in Redfin, I was in Zillow, uh, Trulia. You start seeing company names pop up. So like each state kind of has different companies in that specific state. The very first guy that I went with um, was uh, with a company called Shore West. For whatever reason, their website had the best data. A lot of the, everyone had generally the same properties but for whatever reason, they were able to get all the rents. So when you're analyzing these deals, you want to make sure they cash flow. And I didn't know really what ca- the, the rents were at the properties. But when I'd go to Shore West, they would show me, you know, property unit one, unit two, 500, 700, whatever the number is. I could use that to run all my financials. I was really on to that Shore West. And then I reached out to them. They connected me with the person. And then I used them for probably... I don't know, the first three or four uh, transactions. Um, I've since switched uh, through three other, maybe four other agents uh, to the one that I have now. But that's how I found my agent. And then in terms of um, property manager, you know, I'm working backwards as if I'm a tenant. I need to go find a a rental. Uh, So how would I go about doing that? Well, I go on on the internet search. And so what I did is I I knew exactly the property I was going to buy. Um, I had it under contract. So then I just zoomed in that area and I said, what are the most common company names there? And then there's like two companies. And uh, the one I ended up going with was Berkshire Hathaway. They had rentals literally within like like two blocks of mine. So I went with them. Over time, I just kept going to other property managers just to test it out. And at one point in time at my peak, it was just madness. I had five property managers. Um, I have since consolidated uh, to one, and my life is way, <laughs> way more simplified, way less time investment now. It makes it a little easier to deal with one property manager than several. And in some cases, it can give you a stronger negotiating tool mm-hmm. where if you go to a property manager and you say, I have two or three rentals, you're usually going to get 10%, 9% charge. But if you have five or six units, your monthly rate can go down and your tenant placement fees can go down. Uh, so kind of makes sense to put them all into one basket, as long as you found one that you're, that you're comfortable with. That's what happened. I went from 10% uh, to 8%. So I was able to you know, trim my cost down. Nice. And yeah, on, on the agent thing, home buyers find an agent and they spend a lot of that agent's time looking at properties, taking tours of houses, trying to find the, their forever home. Investors should shop around, or in my opinion, should shop around with agents. And I, even when I have a good agent that I'm working with, I'm still actively getting leads from two other agents. And they they are aware of each other. I don't sign any, what do they call it? Exclusivity uh, clause. Uh, And if they find the deal, I just have to have honor, make sure that's the agent that gets the commission when the deal goes through so that they keep wanting to find me new deals. That's a great, I do. I actually do that same thing. You know, if I look back at the last couple of properties, there's two guys that I use. Uh, one is more like the MLS guy. And then there's another guy that's great at finding these kind of one-off deals and he'll pitch them to me. And then if you bring me the deal, I'll do it. And on the offer I do, it's usually generally built in, like you're an eight, you're a client for, I think it's either 30 or 90 days. And then I just have them change it that for that property, 
I'm when I buy it, you you get paid, uh, no matter you know if the other person ends up bringing me that property. So, a specific deal in Milwaukee. Let's right. do. Let's kind of run the numbers on one. This one is um, a deal uh, that I found off of uh, Craigslist actually, and I bought this property back in Christmas 2018, I think. It was originally listed, I believe, for like either 100 or 110,000. I had ended up uh, doing, uh, uh, talking to her, uh, befriending her, and uh, you know, building that rapport. And I ended up, you know, I really wanted to try this the concept of seller financing out. And so um, I was, I did finance at Amazon for four years. So like, I built these spreadsheets. I, I presented three different offers, you know, like low, medium, high. You know, do you want the highest price or do you want the most down? And uh, was able to ultimately negotiate uh, the final price, ten uh, percent down, ninety thousand, and um, what was the interest? It was thirty year fixed at six percent, uh, and so that was that's the uh, what I set up. And then in terms of numbers, it was a fourplex. Each unit, I think it was like sixteen hundred was the rents at the time. But I know that a one bed. Uh, there was three one bedrooms and one two bedroom. Generally speaking, um, a one bedroom goes for about 500 and a two bedroom, depending on the size and condition is, uh, you know, around 700. So I was like, yeah, if I get it at six, you know, cash flows at 1600 and I can get this easily to 2000, if not, you know, 2200, uh, it's going to make, you know, print money. And so, you know, we were able to come to terms, uh, got it set up. And then, you know, over the last couple of years, um, as tenants move out, I've turned them, increased the rents. Uh, I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head what the rents are now. I don't think it's 2000 but it's more than $1,600. Uh, so it's definitely cash flowing uh, pretty well. And um, I actually just recently refinanced out of that property. So I paid off the seller. The seller was super happy. She, uh, you know, I paid her every month um, and it was all good. And the new interest rate, I'm guessing, is between 3 and 4%. Exactly. 3.5. Yeah. Right. So a uh, good time to refinance. And <laughs> it's probably too late. They probably stopped the video and went into the comments. But before somebody else attacks you in the comments, mm -hmm. every time somebody looks at investing, there are people who are looking for reasons not to because uh, mm -hmm. or analysis paralysis, being afraid, thinking they can't find the deal, not having confidence in themselves. And anytime somebody talks about investments that they did a few years ago, Somebody in the comments will say, must be nice. Can't buy a property like that now. In 2016, people were saying it then too. Mm -hmm. And when somebody says, well, you did 90,000 and 10% down, that's unheard of now. But $500 a month rent per unit is unheard of now. Mm -hmm. uh, your cash flow scales with the price of the property. In 2020, I bought a triplex that was $75,000 more than what I would have ever looked at but interest rates had come down um, because I was paying 6% for properties back in 16, 17, 18 too, just like you. Mm -hmm. um, and then interest rate I got was 3.1 something on the, the triplex. My payment every month is less, the rents are still going higher and the cash flow is better. So for the right. people thinking, because you did it several years ago, it was possible, it was the only reason. I'm under contract for a duplex right now that I found on the MLS that I made an asking price offer on and then negotiated the price down. Uh, the deals are still out there. And instead of attacking somebody in the comments, you should be running the numbers and learning your market, whichever market that is that you're picking. When is the last time you purchased a property? Well, I have purchased one in April. Is uh, So you bought recent. one in 2021? I didn't think that was possible anymore. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah, in 2021, I bought, uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember when I bought these. I think I bought uh, three so far this year. And some people are thinking, so you bought three because you have a really good job with Amazon and you've got cash flowing properties. So that's the only reason you can do it. But how many times have you house hacked? How many purchases have you done for house hack? You know what? That's my biggest regret. I, this is it. This is the only one. So, you, so you've only done one. That's, yeah. that's exactly the point I was making. Somebody who thinks it must be really nice that you can save up down payments now and they might not have the ability to save that much that fast can house hack. And then they can house hack more than once. You've been living there five time, five years. You have to live in each house hack for at least a year. 
um, however long it takes you to save the down payment, maybe two or three years, but that could have been two or three house hacks. And the first house hack is great. I, I know you're loving living for free. And I, I was really close to it. My payment was about $300 a month in my duplex. When I moved into my second house hack, I'm in a fourplex being paid $1,700 a month to live there. Right. And I got to rent out the unit in the duplex for and that, that uh, property is cash flowing $800 a month now. So just being willing to move added $2,500 a month to my income without looking at what I make from work. If you want something, you find a way. If you don't want something, you find an excuse. I can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to come on here and share this with people. Uh, leave some questions in the comments below that we can answer because we touched on a lot of subjects in this and there's things that I was actually unaware of. So I appreciate you coming to share with me too. If anybody wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? Yep. You can find me on Instagram, JC Canberra. I'm on uh, bigger pockets on as well or LinkedIn. Okay. And I know um, um, from personal experience that you like to share your knowledge. You actually run a mastermind group um, and, and you had me speak in it once. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. So I encourage people that have questions to reach out because uh, the really cool thing about reaching financial freedom is being able to share that with other people. Um, and it's awesome that you're doing that too. Exactly. Totally reach out to me. Like when I help somebody buy a property, it helps me feel like I got a property. There's nothing greater than like getting a deal. And so if I can help you get to that first deal, you know, I, I'm pumped about it just as much as you are. That is too awesome. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service.